Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Caroline Hyde, Bloomberg Television. An absolute joy to be here with you this afternoon with a wonderful array of panellists for you. We're going to be discussing democratisation of finance, the rise of the alternative finance in the UK in particular. So just to quickly introduce for you all, we do have Giles Andrew at the end here for us from Zopa. We then have Thomas De Luca, he's CEO of AMP. I'm very pleased to, today it's their launch in Europe, so he's managed to time that well for us. Then we have Louise Beaumont, Head of Public Affairs and Marketing at GLI Finance. And then lastly, just to my left, is Ridian Lewis, CEO of Ratesetter. And guys, we have many a startup investor and indeed startup founder in the audience, I'm sure. And the key they always say to pitching is being able to describe what your company does within in one sentence. So over to all of you, please describe what it is that Rate Setter does and then pass the baton down. So on one side of our business, we have lenders. They are either retail, normal people or institutions. And on the other side of our business, we have borrowers, they are businesses and consumers, and we match them up. Wonderful, Louise, match it. GLI Finance invests in SME finance providers. We have 17 platforms delivering eight different types of SME finance on three continents. At AMP Credit Technologies, we offer a platform that allows banks to use alternative lending style and methodologies to utilize their own balance sheet and to help their small businesses. We think of it as the bank's alternative to alternative lenders. And Giles. Zopa was the first peer-to-peer -peer lending business in the world, and we celebrate our 10th birthday this week. And uh, we connect lenders and borrowers um, without a bank being involved and give both sides of the deal a better, better value, essentially. So let's go for old and wise, a decade old, Giles, and give us... some laughter in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give, give us a sense of what's driven this appetite in the United Kingdom to help build what has been the rise of alternative finance, much quicker than, say, in Europe? Well, I think the fact that we're so far ahead of Europe reflects a number of things. One, we started first. These things take a while. Um, Zopa was, its, was the, only person in, the only business doing this in Europe for probably four or five years. So that just adoption takes a long time. We were trying to build trust in an entirely new asset class, which doesn't happen overnight. And I think, uh, allied to that, we heard earlier this morning about how e-commerce penetration is typically higher in the UK. Consumers are more online than in many European uh, jurisdictions. And from a regulatory point of view, um, we had a regime which allowed us to operate without being caught up by the burdens of regulations that weren't designed for us. Whereas other markets in Europe suffer from the regulator applying bits of banking regulation to a, to a business that shouldn't be regulated as a bank, for example. Um, and we were able to circumvent that more easily. And Louise, give us a sense of well, who've, who's won out from this. Obviously, all your businesses are, are driving this forward and you're, you're obviously being helped by the fact that there's this appetite for mm. alternative finance. But who's winning in terms of the borrower, the lender? The... Ultimately, we all are. Um, the big winner here is the economy. Certainly, if you think about SME finance, it is typically around the world, wherever GLI finances, investee companies operate, SMEs are the engine room of growth. In the US, it's 48.5% of GDP. Here, it's nearer 50% of GDP. If you get fuel to the engine room of the economy, as and when the engine needs it, you get growth. The economy benefits, and as a result of that, we all benefit. I mean, interestingly, many would have felt that it was actually the banks that were losing out. But you're actually coming over here, Thomas, and offering an access point for banks to get into alternative finance. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm something of an apologist for banks, which doesn't make me very popular at, <laughs> at many events. But um, I mean, the fact of the matter is that I think that empowering banks to utilize their superior cost of capital, uh, the information that resides within their databases, the regulatory protections they could offer, uh, not so much consumers, I don't want to wait in consumers, but saying small business lending on that side of things. We think that actually empowering banks to, to utilize those inherent advantages is a, a very scalable, efficient way to approach a large number of SMEs, as Louise points out, such a significant driver of the world economy. Ridian, I mean, what you're doing is actually helping match up, you know, people who want to borrow and people who want to lend and offering the best rates across the board. That's certainly what Zopa and Ratesetter are trying to set themselves apart for. What, how are we seeing 
examples of that benefiting? Your, I mean, because we're actually starting to see big players, not just banks wanting to get in on this, but actually big funds wanting to start to put their cash to work. They want to be lending to the smaller borrower. Is that legitimising your business now? I think it brings a lot of attention to our business and I think it makes a lot of sense because I think that they're smart people and they understand that this is an extraordinary opening up of a market. So previously lending was monopolised by banking or the construct of banking and suddenly um, uh, through technology we've opened that up to anyone being able to lend. Um, and so some smart funds, typically hedge funds, um, have seen this opportunity that they are able to access things that previously were, were only available to banks. Mm. Um, and so they're keen to get ahead and, 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 and lend. Um, so I think the way on the outside world, that boils down to sort of large amounts of money coming into these platforms, which gives it its own, its own sort of legitimacy. Um, Does that affect what rates you're seeing on your platforms that are currently being? Well, we, um, we have a slightly sort of... Our, our, our belief, um, this is a very sort of contentious point, um, because... We like contentious, that's yeah, fine. No, no, and it's worth sort of... Uh, because... We at Ratesetter have um, taken a view in, in, our, in our form of peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, we've introduced something called the Provision Fund, which, without getting too technical, effectively mutualizes a lot of the risk. And uh, uh, it has turned peer-to-peer -peer lending into a, a pretty st stable and predictable, I'm not gonna, not gonna use the word safe because I'm not allowed to, but pretty mm. predictable asset class. Um, and that has meant that the rates are fairly sensible. They sit somewhere between a sort of cash product and very high products, so sort of two to five percent, um, which I think there's a huge amount of demand for that for that yield in mm -hmm. today's environment. Normal people find that terrific. For institutions, that's perhaps a little bit low um, because they then need to take, sort of do something themselves and analyze yeah. the risk a little bit more. Yeah, well, they they, they, they so, so so the way this is breaking in, in our system is that they may not take the protection of our fund. Um, which uh, is interesting because you know, they, they in, in, my sen in my eyes, it sort of validates what we do in the sense I think they have the time and the inclination um, to, 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 to analyze all of this and get a huge amount of diversification of loans. So they don't really want our product at the provision fund. Um, I, I argue for a lot of the mass market, they don't have the scale to diversify across enough loans. So they need the diversification that our fund brings. So uh, we're already seeing the market going in slightly different directions, so mm. different products for different people. Um, I think, so that's going to legitimize the, uh, the market in, in some respects. I think our ultimate aim as a business um, is to be a sort of a marketplace, a bit mm. like a stock market, where we're big enough and deep enough as a market that, that institutions and retail, anybody, just presses the same buttons. Mm. So it's big enough that if you're lending £100, you're pressing the same button as if you're lending a million pounds. You're all at the same rate, all on the same terms, all on the same contract. Now, the stages of development in this industry might break a little bit initially, but that is our ultimate aim. I mean, with 10 years in offering alternative finance, we're now seeing the economy going well, far improved in the United Kingdom. Will that affect the desire to be a peer-to-peer -peer lender or borrower? Will the bank start to be able to provide as well? Or is this, have we hit the, the point of no return now? We are now legitimized and it's going to go forth and prosper. So I think we are legitimized. I mean, if you look at over the last 10 years, we've created an asset class that's actually outperformed most other asset classes in the UK. So from the investing lending side of the equation, it's very much here to stay. So Zopa Lending has outperformed the UK housing index over the last 10 years, which is a kind of startling fact, given our predilection for investing in property in this country. Um, <laughs> and on the borrowing side, um, I think uh, whether or not banks gain greater appetite, we have a, a process and a sort of capital raising process that's simply more efficient. Um, so I, I, I see us very much being here for the long run. And Thomas, with now banks trying to get in on the act too. Interestingly, you're moving to the United Kingdom, getting in on EMEA, but you built the business in Asia. How is it looking from a global perspective? How are other countries doing? Well, we started six years ago in Hong Kong, from there to Singapore and then to the Philippines, uh, at a time where alternative lending really wasn't heard out there. We were the first ones. And one of the things that was interesting is that because the banks hadn't really heard about it, something happening in the UK, something happening in the US, the banks weren't feeling much pressure. The banks need to react to pressure. And part of it is reacting to pressure, but the reality is there's smart people that work in the banks, and they start to see the likes of what we're talking about here, the significant success, 
and they say, we need to get into this. How do we do this? We now feel that we can manage risk in this. It's gone through its cycle. So clearly, that category of product is one that we as a bank ought to look at. Can we get the technology? And I think they'll go into that. But I, I should say, it, it's not a black or white, either or situation. I think that banks, when they step into some of these sectors, will look at tranches with which they feel quite comfortable. I think there will be plenty of opportunity for everybody to play. And we'll just look at different ways, different niches. But they shouldn't just see, the banks should not just see this space um, as a threat to their established business model. The reality is they can make money in a number of ways. One, they could uh, refer their customers to non-bank providers when they themselves decline As the, the Chancellor would like in the United Kingdom. The, the Chancellor is bringing in legislation to do exactly this. It'll be receiving royal, royal assent at the end of March this year and will be enacted uh, with banks being uh, mandated to comply with the legislation um, towards the end of this year. Um, the second way the banks can um, uh, get involved is by, originate, is by investing in the debt originated by the platforms, whether it's in the way that Tom describes or more directly. And the third way, of course, is investing in the companies which are providing the service. So, you know, Barclays has invested in GLI Finance. They are a shareholder in GLI Finance. There are a number of ways that they can get involved. Yes, a few things. Firstly, um, it's remarkable the way that we've sort of within five minutes or ten minutes talking about how banks can do what we're doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, think, I, I think there's a huge uh, momentum to what we're doing, the businesses, as brands, as, as, as businesses, as collections of people. I think they've got huge momentum, and I question whether banks will just have that momentum in certain areas. Uh, I think that's a straightforward business point. Um, and I think the subject of the thing is democratizing finance. I think one, I agree banks could definitely look at some of the assets, the loans that are done through these platforms, which would certainly validate what we do, because we do loans to creditworthy people. Um, what they probably won't do is offer the ability to fund those loans to the people, which I think is the, the core innovation of what all of this is about, mm -hmm. which is that loans, uh, you know, loans have been written for many hundreds of years and continue to get written. And, and I think that, well, I definitely think that peer to peer lending is bringing some incremental credit. Um, mm -hmm. but, but generally, the real breakthrough here is that people, everyone, can now access those returns on those loans. So that's the really democratizing force here. So while banks will get into it, they won't offer their, on the other side, their savers or their depositors or their investors necessarily the, the ability to get into these loans. Having been, having been around for 10 years, is there, what happens when you start to see the level of defaults becoming noteworthy in the press? We've all sung this from the same hymn sheet saying how wonderful it is, alternative finance, and indeed, you know, the fact that we are able to make access to finance for SMEs and, and individuals, but of course some of them go sour. Are we educating those potential lenders enough about that? Well, we've been through a credit crisis, so we launched in 2005, and in, if you look at the sort of lending history of Zopa throughout that period, it's really interesting. So in 2008, our annualised, deep, our annualised credit losses went up about 1.5%, at a time when the yields on the loans went up about 1%. So in the middle of the worst credit crisis uh, since the 1930s, Zopa net returns went down about half Why a percent. Why was that? What, what do you I, think well, I think we did a pretty good job. Uh, uh, I think, I think you know, it wasn't an accident. Um, and I think we've learned more since then to do an even better job in the next credit crisis, credit which picking? will happen. I'm sorry? In credit picking? I mean, when you say you've done a good job... Well, because... in credit analysis, yes. So in choosing the people who we wish to lend to. And, and, and I mean, a lot, a lot of trust is going to come from, you know, a whole ecosystem building up around this. And as Giles says, it takes time. And there was a big announcement a couple of weeks ago with a company called, you know, um, called Altfi that actually has come up with the first returns index for peer-to-peer -peer lending, mm. which is a big thing for us because... From, they've taken every single loan ever written in peer-to-peer -peer lending from the major platforms, and I'm sure they'll add other platforms, and, and, and plotted the, the net return, i.e. the return after, after these defaults, ever since 2005, so nearly you know, 10 years. So now everyone can see uh, an index that would look, you know, wouldn't go missing in, in, a, in a Bloomberg screen. It looks terrific. Um, and so these are the kind of things that are being put in place by the industry um, or by people on the, on the outside of the industry to, to, build, to build trust. Um, and that takes a little bit of time. And we would never forget for a credit business. So we live or die on the quality of our credit decisioning. And because we're lending in medium-term loans, sort of two, three, four, five-year loans, we don't get a result immediately. So therefore, losses don't transpire immediately. And I think that means that the responsible platforms have to behave quite conservatively. But what about when you have enough people drawn into wanting to lend and wanting to lend at a very high risk? Um, 
uh, are we seeing the market graduate to that at the moment? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, we don't necessarily accommodate that on our, on our website, but um, I could see that there will be sites that do accommodate that, and um, I, there's a perfectly valid argument that that, that, that you know, because for the, for as many conversations about financial inclusion and so forth, one has to remember the cost of that. And if if you if you can find a group of lenders willing to to do that on a fair and equitable basis, then terrific. Um, and so I'm sure you'll see the peer peer to peer mechanic being used for that. Louise, is there anything holding back even more growth in this, particularly in the United Kingdom at the moment? The big issue, and it's not here in this hall, is is awareness and understanding. I mean, we've talked about education. Um, and we've talked about educating our kids. Um, we also need to educate our SMEs. Um, there are 5.2, 5.3 million SMEs in this country alone. And they recognize they need money about five minutes after they think they might want money. And that, po that point then about educating them about the range of finance options which are available to them because they have a, almost 100%, this is an internet fact, almost a 100% track record of asking for the wrong type of finance. They'll ask for something which doesn't really exist anymore. They'll ask for an overdraft. 15 years ago, 30% of SMEs had an overdraft. Now, it's 15%. They'll then ask for a loan, and they're going to the bank because that's the first place you go to ask for money. But the reality is, the banks are set up to deal with, to lend to industrial revolution type companies. Larger companies wanting bigger sums of money for longer periods of time secured on assets. Of those 5.2, 5.3 million SMEs in this country, the vast majority of them were born over the last 20 to 30 years, and the vast majority of those are knowledge economy companies, intellectual property companies. At the end of the day, the knowledge asset, which is often the only asset in the business, gets in the lift and goes home. So it is about educating the kind of companies that the banks weren't set up to serve, but which are perfectly creditworthy companies, to understand that there are different places to go to to get the money, and that they might ask for something different in terms of a service. They may want trade finance, invoice finance, they may want a bond. They may also want a loan. So there are a wide variety of different product types, as well as places from whom you can source those products. Tom, so, yeah. I, I would actually just say, though, some of that actually, I think, supports my position, mm. uh, as a matter of fact. But when we first did our market research coming into to the UK marketplace, with all of the innovation and uh, obviously a lot of development going on, a lot of competition, one of the things that we kept hearing back from, from the SMEs that we surveyed was trust as a key factor. And I think this is what Louise is exactly describing. These are products that have not been available until recently. There's a lot of competing, uh, it's all five, but we, you know, we address very different customer segments here. And I think there's a lot of confusion amongst the SMEs. The SME, first place they do go is to their bank because that's where they keep their money. It's where they do their paychecks. That's how they pay their customers. Or rather, they receive payment from their customers. It's how they pay their suppliers and their employees. The argument that we have is actually, would not a small business owner prefer to be able to go to the bank, or in fact, for the bank to contact them with a useful product that they could actually grow their business with? And again, it's, it's not black or white, either or, but I do believe that people prefer to hear this from their banks. They feel more comfortable. I do think banks would have a superior advantage when loans become ever more commoditized and the returns go down. I think banks will win on cost of capital, but also cost of overhead cost of origination, cost of customer acquisition. And, and, yeah. I, and by the way, I mean, I think some, the, I think the players in this, on this panel have already established very significant positions that won't change. But I do think we can go through a period of consolidation in a short period of time. Yeah, just, just say, I mean, just an assumption on cost of capital. I mean, yes, banks have trillions of pounds sitting around at very cheap rates, but there is a cost to that for themselves. Namely, when they squeal about large capital requirements and liquidity requirements, that is the regulator saying that if you want to be have safe deposits and a low cost of capital, which is an assumption that seems to just go on and on and on, then you have to pay for it. So the cost of banking has gone up structurally in the last five or six years, mm. and um, therefore banks can't necessarily assume that they can do loans cheaper than these platforms. These platforms will soon start doing loans cheaper than banks. Uh, and banks will wake assumption. up to the fact that this is not just 
when they get round to it, they'll come back into this market. Mm. Structurally, we will just be more efficient. I think I agree on the overhead point. I think we're still too small to have a... I mean, I think we're more cost efficient than banks, but because we still operate at quite a small scale, um, the advantage to scale of the bank still outweighs our cost advantage. But once we get to scale, then we will be more efficient, I'm sure, because I think that, again, it's not a criticism, it's just that banks have built up legacy systems, obsolete procedures, and so forth, and getting them out of the system just takes a vast amount of time, whereas all these platforms are being built in the internet age, they're very clean systems, and that's just a big cost advantage. In the same way, the bond market has massive cost advantages, now it's at scale, and, and large companies do not borrow money from banks anymore because it is cheaper and more efficient using the bond market, and we've created an equivalent to the bond market, which I, I agree with Ridian, at scale, it is going to be a cheaper platform. No Thomas question. says there's going to be a period of consolidation. Will rate setter, will SOPA be bought by banks? I think we, we had a bit of a conversation about this this morning. I think it's very hard for a bank to retain the cost advantages which we're proposing to you mm. in an environment where, where they acquired us. Mm. We're going to have to wrap it up now, but I just want from each of you a, a bit of a pluck a figure from the air or give us a, a view on, we understand alternative financing could hit 7 billion euros this year. Now that's versus 2.3 billion last year. So massive growth. But by 2020, do you have any figures, any idea of how big this market could be? Do you want to start with Giles? <laughs> 2020 is five years time. Um, the UK personal loans market for unsecured lending, which is all we do, consumer lending, is about 25 billion quid a year. There's no reason why peer-to-peer -peer shouldn't be at least 10 billion of that, getting towards half. Okay, you've just been running your, you've been analysing the UK market, Thomas. You got any ideas, any foresights how big this could be? We have very significant and ambitious growth plans for this market, and of course from this market into the, the greater EMEA region. Uh, but it's sort of taken the bait to suggest it's going to be alternative lending. My whole point is that it's not going to be that much alternative anymore when it becomes mainstream and banks start servicing their clients the way they're supposed to, using the technologies that we've invested. I think it's a little bit more simple than that. Um, the way that we're servicing the marketplace, really, is it, is it that alternative now? I, I think maybe 2015 is the year we just lose that moniker. I never got to set the lexicon for the industry. But I don't think we're that alternative. We're just more efficient. I think maybe, maybe this is all just a little too loving for you, but we're just complementary finance, really, aren't we? Very nice. Yeah, very nice. Uh, I, I, I think I, all I'd say, I wouldn't put a number to it, but I mean, in the United States, the amount of lending that's done outside banks is bigger than the lending done inside banks. Mm. Uh, that already exists. It's just it's not called like that. It's called you know the, the bond market and the alternative credit market and so forth. And I suspect maybe in 2025 or 2020, whatever the date is, maybe we'll get closer in Europe to to that going past 50/50. Because at the moment we're way way behind the states on that. And with that, it's a wrap. Please do show your appreciation. A fantastic panel.